Pastor Jamal because wherever you hear that song I figured he'd be but I'll give you the details good morning family good morning. you look blessed and amen. amen again and again and again that's our confession that's our confession of faith let's bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer Heavenly Father thank you for community thank you for this spiritual family this community of faith thank you that this is not just another year, it's a new year, which means new beginnings, new opportunities, new promises, new oppositions, new threats, but you remain the same through it all. We can count on you, we can trust in you, Lord God, no matter what we're facing in the year ahead. So we take this year with excitement and with courage. Thank you for that word, that theme that we will live out every day, every moment, every hour. Thank you for this morning as we gather together in worship, in communion, in celebration and faith, but also to open our hearts and minds to the wisdom and instruction of your word. Once again, touch these hearts and minds to hear, to understand, and to receive. We ask in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Come on, greet three people before you're seated. give you another installment on courage. Can I do that today? But first, I have got some reminders. Um, okay, I can't say that out loud if it's a secret. Can you all keep a secret? Okay, so... Pastor Jamal's not in the building, right? Okay. Live streaming? All right, so because of inclement weather, we had to shift some things around. So we'd planned something special. So we're gonna do it next week next Sunday so don't you say anything you online around the world don't say anything amen praise the Lord so next week in fact you're going to get an email and it'll give you some details so I don't say too much all right so check your email this week it'll be going out to you and it's going to give you some information amen Praise the Lord. Uh, also, I just want to take the time to thank all of you for your cards, your gifts, your well wishes to Pastor Karen and I, Pastor Jamal, Lady Rita throughout the Christmas season and the holiday. We take the time to read every one of them and appreciate all the things that you want to share with us. So we're very grateful for your love for your generosity and for your expressions during the holiday season. It does not go by without that appreciation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know who sent that message, right? Praise the Lord. Amen. I think we got it all. I'm excited about this year's theme as it continues to mature and grow. How many know that a message matures and grows? in your life. You get a word, it comes in seed form, and the Genesis law is that everything begins in seed form, and then what? Grows into an experience. So when you come to get the word on Sunday or whenever, 
All right? That word is being seeded. It's being sown into your hearts. And the objective is for it to take root, grow, and bear much fruit. One of the things that I've learned to do is not to give away my seed, but to give the fruit of it. I'm going to try that one more time. Too often you get a word, you don't let it settle in your own heart, in your own mind, and grow and develop, and you get excited about it, and you give it away without, it give, giving, without giving it that time to grow and mature. You want that word to be productive in you so that you can share it with others. Amen? So as we think about courage and what it takes courage to do, to experience, we opened up on New Year's Eve talking about it takes courage to admit need. How many of you were blessed by that word, if you got that word? If you haven't seen it, I think it's available uh, on our YouTube channel. You need to get hold of it. It takes courage to admit need. It takes courage to face reality. It takes courage to make decisions. Now, I've got a list of other things that it takes courage to do, focusing on these things to unpack them so that you'll grow. Today, I want to look at the fact that it takes courage to keep your mind on the big picture. It takes courage to keep your mind on the big picture. And remember, our definition for courage is keeping your Mind, your will, and emotions in alignment with your goals, your dreams, your objectives, whatever the task is at hand. Your mind has to do with your thoughts. How many know thoughts are powerful? They're very influential. That's why Jesus said, give no thought for tomorrow. He's talking about walking in faith and trust in God's providential guidance, in God's providential protection, and God's providential provision. You have to be careful. You are the guardian of your mind. Your mind is like a garden. And whatever grows there is your fault. Because you are what you think. The quality of your thinking determines the quality of your life. And what we've learned, just I, I remember when, when, when we first planted grass and started setting things up, and all of a sudden, weeds started shooting up. And that was before we developed the land next door in terms of making it right for our parking lot. This is when we first moved into the building. So there were weeds and, 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 and all kinds of stuff growing over there. And I said, Elder Shaw, you know, we got all these weeds growing in the stuff that we just planted. He said, yeah, they're coming from next door. And the idea is that the wind will carry seeds from other locations and they will land in your garden. So it's not only what you sow, but what circumstances, situations, what life slows, what so, so, sows, what blows in the wind. So you've got to go into your garden and you'll find things in it that you didn't sow which needs to be weeded out. It's a wonderful book Call As a Man Thinketh. How many read that book? And if, not, if it's not in your library, you need to get it. As a Man Thinketh. It comes from the Proverbs. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's really ex extrapolation of the text, but it still works. Because as you think, the way you think is critical. So you must guard your heart, you must guard your mind, you must guard your thoughts. And as I said on New Year's Eve, don't 
allow squatters in your mind. These are thoughts that are unproductive, they're just taking up space, and in fact, they're detrimental to you. You have no right to be there. Rebuke them. Get rid of them. Tell them that they have no place there. Don't let them take root in your mind. Thoughts are powerful. And if you allow them to linger, they will influence you. They will influence you. So courage is aligning your thoughts, your will. And when I talk about will, I'm talking about the choices that you make. Our lives are composed of our choices. You are the sum total today of all the choices that you've made. Good and bad. And every day we are faced with making choices. And your emotions, your feelings. And how many know that these things can go in different directions? How many have had your mind in one direction, your, your, your choices in another direction, your feelings in a different direction, all at the same time? Not like they take turns. Mm-mm. Your mind could say, you know, we should go that way. Your emotions saying, well, I don't, I'm not feeling that. And your will is saying, I wish y'all would make up your mind. <laughs> but it's true, it's reality. So courage is bringing these three into alignment with the task at hand, with your gold. With your gold, with your objectives. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Don't make choices that take you in the opposite direction of your dreams. Don't do it. And you've got to think, you've got to think that I'm about to make a choice. What direction is this choice going to take me? I know where I want to go, what I have to do to get there. But I'm facing a choice. Is that choice going to take me in the direction of my dreams? So courage is aligning your mind, will, and emotions that take you in the direction of your dreams, your objectives, and your goals. And one of the realities is you've got to keep the big picture in mind. And we're always wrestling with the big picture. We're always wrestling with the big picture. The big picture elevates you beyond your own selfish self. And it forces you to think about who else is involved? Who else is going to be affected? How it's going to impact the bigger dream, the bigger goal. If you're selfish, you don't, keep, you don't think about the big picture. You only think about your immediate need, your immediate feelings, immediate gratification. But if you're going to fly with the eagles this year, I'm just saying, if you're going to fly with the eagles this year, you're going to stay focused on the big picture. One of the things that was continuously a message to individual leaders who were involved in the civil rights movement was keep your eyes on the prize. In other words, don't allow the little things that happen along the way that can distract you don't let them take you away from the goal. Keeping your mind on the big picture is critical, but it is a discipline because it's easy to major on the minors. And the devil would love to have you caught up 
in the little things. He would love to make you petty. And petty people create drama. Out of trivial things. That's just the way they're wired until they choose to be otherwise. And, and, and you wonder why they're getting hung up on something that matters so little. Everything weighs something, but you better know how much it weighs. Because every decision in life is a value judgment. You're making a value judgment when you make a choice, when you make a decision. And, and, and the climate that we're in, where the slightest little thing ends up on social media, explodes and then travels around the world, it is reinforcing pettiness. And you can't become one of the petty people. Because you, you have to stop and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You getting caught up on this? And we got all this to deal with? And the devil will use that as distraction to take you away from your goal. To make you forget about the big picture. I mean, on a very practical level, we're in this building today because we had to keep thinking about the big picture. There was an impending storm. There were two models. The European model, <laughs> if you watch the weather reports, the GPS model and some other model, <laughs> three, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and they were saying, well, if this model comes, there's gonna be more snow in New York City and Long Island in the Jersey coast, but if the other model comes, the snow is going to be upstate, we're going to get rain. And we've got to decide, do we open the building? Do we have service? Do we go completely virtual? If we go completely virtual, then we've got to set things up so that the word can come, the praise and worship, everything can be in place. And we've got staff, and the staff is asking, when are you going to make the final decision? We're still watching the weather. We made that final decision uh, yesterday at 1 p.m., and we sent notice out to our staff. And why? Because we're concerned about the safety of our members who would come out, the safety of our staff who would have to be here, and the fact that we have members coming from New Jersey, up, up Westchester, uh, Long Island, all over the place. And people will make decisions best based upon, you know, whether we're going to be open or, or what. So we've got to go through all of this. You just show up. <laughs> we've got to understand what it takes to mobilize staff quickly. And the fact that we've got to put them on the hold to the last minute, which means that they would have to quickly make decisions and get things in place. All of that goes on, folks. I know you don't have to think about that, but we do. Because we're thinking about the, the what? Come on, we're looking at the what? The big picture. Often, I get criticized because I'm a public figure, a high profile figure, and people are watching and listening to my response to social issues, whether they're political, whether they're racial, whether they're religious, no matter what context it may be in, there are those who are waiting to hear what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do, how I'm going to respond, how I'm going to react. Things can blow up on social media that are in proximity to me. I'm going to try that one more time because I'm kind of speaking in code. <laughs> Things can blow up on social media that are in proximity to me because I've been there at a meeting or there with an individual or there as part of a situation or there. How many understand what I'm talking about? And people say, well, you know, I saw you at such and such a place. I saw you on the news. I saw you with so-and-so. I saw you. And, and I've got to stand back and say, okay, do I weigh in? Do I not weigh in? What are the consequences? What are the benefits? If any. 
What's the social pressure that would come? Does my congregation expect me to weigh in? What do I know that the public doesn't know that informs me differently in terms of how I should respond? What do I know and can't say? Or maybe shouldn't say? See, you see, I'm privy to information that is part of what governs my response. So if I'm privy to information the public is not privy to, and I weigh in on something, I've got a lot to allow that information that I'm privy to to shape and inform how I weigh in and whether or not I weigh in. Especially if I know something else is coming. But I get criticized. I take the heat. I got tough skin. It's okay. Because I see the... Jesus was always about the big picture. And there are times he could have allowed himself to be distracted by the public, by the social political climate, by economics, even by the people close to him. But he knew how to check them and put them in perspective. In one, in one conversation, it got so intense, he had to take Tell, tell one of his staff members, get behind me, Satan. Did you all read that part? It takes courage. It takes the alignment of your mind, your will, and emotions towards a specific goal or objective and your commitment to that ultimate goal or objective. It takes courage to not say something when you could. But it's not wise. Let's go through some illustrations. Can we do that? And I'll share with you some personal examples. Can we do that? That's because you're nosy. Let's go to... The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17. Um, 17.24. Are you ready to study? Okay, good. This is a teaching ministry, remember? <laughs> Spirit and Word. Spirit and Word. So Matthew 17, 24, there's a corollary passage that we will look at in the Gospel of Mark, but this is when Jesus is facing the temple tax. There was a tax, okay? When, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, Matthew 17, 24. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the tax? Notice the setup here. They're trying to trap him and they're putting him between his faith and the government. Does your teacher not pay the tax? Do you see how that's worded? He said, yes. The interesting thing is, Peter didn't know. <laughs> but he acted thinking that he was defending Jesus. And this is not the first time that Peter's done something like this. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. <laughs> saying, Notice, notice what's going down here. The tax collectors come to Peter. 
They asked Peter, does your master not pay taxes? In other words, they're trying to imply he doesn't. So he comes into the house and Jesus, knowing what's going down, looks at Peter and says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. In other words, you don't exploit your family. So Jesus is challenging Peter on his position with regard to the validity of taxation and how the tax system works and who should be taxed and who should not be taxed. Verse 27, however, not to give offense to them Go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. That's a very nice, isn't it? Let me tell you something. I wish when tax time came around... All I had to do was go fishing. <laughs> Indicator of, of his authority, his knowledge. And let me tell you something. I, I, the sea is full of fish. The first fish that comes up, that's suspect. <laughs> that had to be a setup. The timing of it. Peter goes there and when he arrives in time to fish, a very specific fish with a coin in his mouth, that's enough to pay both of their taxes? Are y'all with me here this morning? And with, this, with, the, with the confidence that Peter was going to find that fish and the shekel would be in the fish's mouth. I'm not telling, Peter was, Jesus wasn't telling Peter to hope for something. He was giving him instructions. And all he had to do was follow them. And I love the generosity. It'll cover mine. I got you. Notice. But I want to take a look at the words that, that Jesus spoke here. Verse 27. However, not to give offense to them. In other words, however, not to offend them, we're going to pay the taxes. Are you listening? All right. They were looking for an opportunity to trap him and bring charges against him. They were out to get him. However, not to give offense to them, Go to the sea and cast the hook and catch the fish. Let's go to Mark chapter 12, verse 14. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. I'm sorry, beginning of verse 13. Gospel of Mark. Are you there? Mark 12, 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, teacher. Look at the setup. Listen. Listen. We know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. <laughs> For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. I mean, you just butter it up and then you throw it in the furnace. Is it lawful? To pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them? Or should we not? And of course, whatever he says, right? They're setting him up. I love verse 15. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? 
Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness, whose image inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Now listen, the big picture. His disciples were ready to fight. In fact, at one point, Jesus had to tell Peter, put away your sword. It was expected that he was going to lead in a physical revolt. He had enough followers. Thousands and thousands of people were moved by his message and his miracles. And it gave great concern to the religious leaders, the political leaders, and even the empire, even though that was an outpost. And that's why when he stood before Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my servants would fight. But they were concerned. So he knows that they're trying to trap him. And he could have said, no, it is unjust. The execution of taxes unfairly at unstable rates. In fact, high rates that are designed to keep the people in poverty because that's what was going on. That's why the Jewish people hated the tax collectors of their own people oppressing their own people. And Jesus could have responded by saying, well, you know what? It's not fair. No. Shouldn't give Caesar anything. It would have created a stir, an uprising, a riot. Word would have gotten back. Military would have responded. And guess what? He would have never made it to the cross. But what did he have to keep in mind? It wasn't a matter of who was right or who was wrong politically. Are y'all with me? Are you hearing me? <laughs> now notice the setup. Notice the setup. They say to him, we know that you have no respecter of person. And you are a man of the truth. The disciples watching him. Knowing that he has power and authority, knowing and observing, witnessing his power. They're watching him stand down on this one. Can you imagine how they may have criticized him? And we don't have the time to go through it. But how they could have criticized him for his decision to not stand up. And you got to understand, this is moving closer and closer to his arrest. And he's already talking about... Ah, well, the Son of Man is going to have to suffer many things, and he's going to be killed, but on the third day, he's going to rise again. The disciples are already wondering, well, wait a minute. This is, this is inconsistent. There's an incongruency here. He's got all this power and influence, and yet he's not using it. Are you all with me this morning? He was keeping his mind on what? The big picture and just because you have power and influence doesn't mean you should exercise it carelessly it was in the beginning when the devil said to him if you are the son of God throw yourself down because it is written the angels have been given charge over you to protect you and bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone little King James language there and he said you shall not put God to the test. Is it true about his protection? Yes, because it was angels that were with him in the wilderness when he was being tempted by the devil. If you read it carefully, he was out amongst the wild beasts, the scripture said, but there were angels there protecting him, watching over him and caring for him while he was there. It was, a, it was a temptation, throw yourself down it was a temptation for him to take his power and use it recklessly. And just because you got power, God knows he's got to be able to trust you with that power. Just like the people have to know that they have to be able to trust you with the power that they give you. And that's one of the big questions when you're going to cast your vote and elect someone and give them power. What are they going to do with that power? 
Can they be trusted with that kind of power? Got to understand what's going on. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Oh, man, no. You know what? Can I spend another minute on that one? Let's go to John 17, 12. John 17, 12. John chapter 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. He's at the end of his mission. He's speaking to his father. And basically, he's, he's homesick. He said, restore to me the glory that I had with you from the beginning. <laughs> he's ready to go home. Notice what he says here. Verse 12. Are you there? While I was with them here on earth, I kept them in your Name, which you have given me. Talking about his disciples. Are you there? I have, come on, ESV translation. And if you don't have it, it's, it's on the screen. I have what? I have what? Guarded them and, come on, not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, which is who? Judas, right? That the scripture might be fulfilled. Notice what's in his mind in the big picture. He cannot have any of these guys die. None of them can be wounded or killed. They could not die for him. He came to die for them. And if one of them had died for him, it would have changed the whole narrative. So he had to make sure nothing, nothing, nothing happened to these guys that the father assigned to him. And now in his high priestly prayer, what is he praying? I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the one we knew would be lost. He said, have not I chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil. He understood that. Let's go to John chapter 18, verse 9. Well, I'm sorry. John chapter 18. Let's go to verse 1. John 18, 1. Are you there? When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, was betrayed. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. You got it? So Judas was betraying him. He's going to tell them exactly where to find Jesus and the other guys. Verse 3, so Judas, having procured a band of soldiers, look at this, and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, whom do you see? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why? I am. Was expressing his identity. That's a lot of power, folks. So he asked them again. Whom do you seek? It's almost like warning him. You guys need to know who you're dealing with here. <laughs> and they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, what? Come on. Let these men 
Go. This was for, to fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you, come on, gave me. I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And of course, he was talking about the cup of death. But notice, he's doing everything he can to protect these guys. Why? Because he's focused on the what? Big picture. In fact, he said to them, he said, he said, what do you think? Don't you know that right now I can call to my father and he will send 12 legions of angels? Now that's overkill because one legion took out 270,000 men in the Old Testament. 12 legions, that's overkill. But Jesus said to them, what do you think? I can't right now call to my father that I don't have that power to call to my father. And he'll send and respond. Twelve legions of angels. Legion, and this will all be over. Twelve legions of angels. And this will all be over. But if I do that, how then will the scripture be fulfilled? What was constantly informing the use of his power? His word. His interaction with the authorities. Can I tell you how many times in my own life the big picture was the determining factor in what I said or did not say, what I did or did not do, because I was watching the big picture. And guess what? It takes courage. I'm going to try that one more time. It takes courage. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. Oh, man, there's that clock again. All right, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. I'm sorry, Galatians, not Genesis. That's because I wish the clock was back at the beginning. So, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, and that's generic, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, you who are what? Spiritual. Not you who are critical. Not you who are hyper-religious and self-righteous. Not you who are judgmental. You who are what? Come on. Spiritual. Elevate this thing. You who are what? Spiritual. spiritual. So if you are as spiritual as you say you are, claim to be or represent to be, what should be your actions in response to someone who is taken in a transgression? What's it say? You who are spiritual should what? Restore him in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Gentleness. And, and, and the word restore there, interesting word, because it has to do with a restaurant. And what do you do at a restaurant? You feed people. In other words, restoration is getting that person back on their feet. Re-empowering them, forgiving them, helping them go through a process of, of, of standing back up. Claiming and holding responsibility for whatever it is that took place. But too often in the Christian community, we shoot our wounded. And the scripture says, if you carry that level of... You got to understand, I, I, all right? I carry a higher level of responsibility in the kingdom of God. Because of the delegated authority that's been entrusted to my care. So how I weigh in on things is critical. You know, it's interesting as I sat there and, and, and listened to Israel's testimony. And I was so blessed to hear him openly, because I'm not going to say it. But he was willing to openly share his experience. 
I've watched what the body of Christ does, especially to high profile individuals. And too often, we don't respond with the big picture in mind. And in a world where we can let social media shape and inform us, that's a dangerous thing, folks. That's a dangerous thing. But there's a responsibility. There's a responsibility that comes. There's a parable called the wheat and the tear. How many, how many read that parable? Raise your hands. I want to see how, if anybody didn't read it. Okay. All right, good. So you're familiar with Matthew chapter 13. I don't, I don't have to go through it. I can talk through it, right? Jesus gave a parable. He said that, that a sower sowed good seed in his field. He later interprets that parable. He says the field is the world. The good seed are the children of God, the children of the Son of Man. The sower is the Son of Man. He said, but an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. So when they came and they saw it, the angels looked at it and said, well, wait a minute. The servant said, wait, wait a minute. Didn't you sow good seed here? He said, yes. How did the weeds get here? An enemy did that. The enemy, he defines in the text as the devil. So while God is sowing, the Son of Man is sowing, Jesus is sowing, the devil is sowing seed. And those who are influenced by him. And here, 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 here it is. And we could, boy, we could spend so much time on this to unpack this. The angels say, do you want us to remove the weeds? And the master responds and says, no. Let them grow together. And when it's time for harvest, whenever that may be, do not just take that and apply it to the end of the world. Because the scripture says, whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. So there is a harvest for whatever anyone sows in life. He said, no, let them both grow together. Why? He answers that question. Because while you're trying to pull up the weeds, you may at the same time pull up the wheat. Because they can be so intertwined that you can't tell the difference and when I read that pastoral I said wow that is brilliant because Jesus was concerned about the what and sometimes when you take action against evil without considering the impact that it's going to have on good you can dismantle all the good that was done by something that is now evil. But you got certain Christians who are just so self-righteous. <laughs> that they don't know how to deal with these things. Why? Because they're not looking at the what? Big picture. So a person in my position has to say, okay, whatever I do and say is going to affect a lot of people. How I respond to any given situation, no matter what the subject matter, is going to affect a lot of people. Why didn't pastor do something? Why didn't pastor say something? <laughs> yeah, he's all that. <laughs> you self-righteous little... Like you have all the information. You don't have all the information. Only God has all the information. And God knows how to, when necessary, surgically remove something. So that the whole body is not lost in the process. We come in with a wrecking ball. And heavy equipment. Back up. 
I got this. <laughs> and we have all these people killed in the process. All this destruction takes place. And then you look back and see the devastation. I got rid of it, didn't I? <laughs> and everybody in the process you got rid of. It takes courage because you have to be willing to take a beating from people who are ignorant, people who have their own personal agenda. You've got to deal with all the stuff. And if you don't have the courage to do that, how many understand what I'm talking about? Can I, can I just stretch it a little bit more? So Jesus, and you got to be careful because the human ego is huge. And we can come to the place where we think we know better than God. Turn your neighbor and say, he's talking about somebody you know, and it may be you. <laughs> so the conversation begins with, whom do men say that I am? He's talking to his disciples. And the disciples, well, some say Jeremiah. Some say John the Baptist, resurrected from the dead. Some say Elijah the prophet. Uh, who do you say that I am? And then a moment of inspiration, moment of divine inspiration. Peter is elevated above the rest. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven. And you shall be called Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Can you imagine how that blew Peter's head up? He's talking about me. <laughs> Pete. <laughs> Did you hear what he said? He's going to build the church. Oh, man. And the gates of hell won't prevail. No sooner Jesus finishes that, he then begins to talk about his death and his resurrection, and hell shows up. And what does Peter do? The one who was elevated. He steps up. He says, be it far from you, Lord. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> this will never happen to you. I'm Peter. Remember me? I got the gates of hell covered, Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Because you are mindful not of the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And what was he saying? He was saying, Peter, you've got the wrong perspective. You have got the human perspective. You need a divine perspective to understand the big picture requires that I suffer. And you missed the part that I was going to be raised from the dead. Because if you believe that, you wouldn't worry about the suffering and the cross. But he was already expressing. He didn't believe all the way. And Jesus had to tell him, back up. Back up. It sounded good. It may have come out of Peter's care and love for Jesus. Or it may have been shaped and influenced by the Jewish notion that Messiah wouldn't die when Messiah comes. He's going to lead them into victory. So if he's going to die, then maybe he's not the Messiah. And three and a half years of my life has just gone down the drain. I left my house, my wife, my family, my mother-in-law. <laughs> and he promised me. That in this life, I'll get houses and land and expansion of family and fruitfulness. And now he's talking about dying on a cross? Uh-uh. Can't let this happen. And Jesus had to put him in his place. Say, back up. You don't understand. There's something bigger than you going on here. Are y'all hearing me this morning, family? You know, well, no, we'll, we'll do that next time. 
There have been major times when we have had leaders make decisions in this nation that shaped the future of this nation. And I try to put myself in those positions, not because I'm there, but as a leader, what would they go through? What were they thinking? And in a very divided time in our nation, as we're thinking about the election ahead of us this year, the social, political, economic forces, spiritual and moral forces that will be at play. Let me tell you something. It's going to be a very spirit, very busy spiritual season, 2024. Because we live in a parallel universe. And whatever we see in the physical is a manifestation of what's going on in the spiritual realm. How many of y'all still believe that? So I'm watching and learning. I'm observing and listening. And it's going to require courage, wisdom, prudence, and discernment. And I'll get back to the difference between those things. It's going to require us to look at the bigger picture of things on an ongoing basis. But I thought about Abraham Lincoln and how he had to balance the politics of the day with principle, moral principle, in making a critical decision as to the future of this nation. And there is enough information to clearly express that it's not that Lincoln was so anti-slavery that he was motivated to make the decision that he did. In fact, he made some comments about slavery which demonstrates that it's not that he was an abolitionist. But he understood that the future of the nation rested on its cohesion. And if, they, if he didn't make a distinction to unify, a decision rather, to unify it, regardless of the political climate, because the tension was between the political demands of the society and what was morally right. And he had to bring those th two things together. Out of it came the Emancipation Proclamation. It cost him his life. But the fact still remains. He had to transcend either or and understand the big picture and make decisions on that basis. Those are the kind of politicians we need. Those are the kind of elected officials we need in positions of power when we're going to give them that power by the exercising of our vote. It's going to be a very interesting season. I'll be making commentary along the way as we talk about courage and the year ahead. Did you get anything out of this today? This is very real, folks. I'll share a little secret with you as I close. I was offered a million dollar bribe once actually twice, to sell out our community. I did not have to deliberate. Hope you understand what I just said. I was able to answer immediately. And when my attorney called me to tell me about it, he said, he said, well, you know, uh, somebody made you an offer. I said, what kind of an offer? I said, a million dollars. He said, oh, to the church? He said, no, to you personally. I said, what? I said, is it legitimate? Is it real? He said, yes. I said, how long have you known me? He said, 25 years. I said, do you think that I'm going to sell out my community and take that million dollars? He said, no, but I had to present it to you because nobody ever gave me a bribe of a million dollars to offer to one of my clients. <laughs> I said, well, you know what the answer is. He said, I expected it. He said, thank you. 
I'll get back to them. The higher up you go in life, the more power and influence you get in life. You are tested according to your value in the kingdom. Are y'all listening to me? And your longevity will be determined by how you respond to those tests. There's one thing that I want to hear. Well done. Good and faithful servant. I got my flaws. Yeah, like everybody else. But I want to hear those words. I want to finish well. Come on, stand on your feet. The right Reverend Misha Field is waiting in the wings to speak to our viewing audience and to you to make sure that you have an opportunity to surrender your life to Christ. I pray that it was worth you traveling through the rain and getting here today. God bless you. I love you. I, I thought he was going to break out into song. I, I didn't. That through the rain hit my ears kind of musically. We close every service by saying Jesus is Lord. But we can't do that without giving someone the opportunity to make him Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, leave those weeds alone. It takes courage to keep your mind on the big picture. In giving marching orders for the mind, will, and emotions, pastor told us to line up our souls with our goals. Because we've been sowing, but life has been blowing, and running against the wind is tough enough. But our choices can take us in the opposite direction of our dreams. Eagles don't waste time worrying about the opinions of turkeys or the Facebook feed of snakes because neither of them can be found at 20,000 feet. And if you can fly, you should fly because the sky's the limit and that is good news. The good news is that a holy God so loved a rebellious world that he sent his only begotten son to live a sinless life, die in our place, and rise from the grave conquering death. And in doing so, he paid the price for our sin and gives us a right to everlasting life. The good news is that family doesn't pay taxes. The good news is that Jesus has a literal, figurative, and symbolic money fish for you too. The good news is you don't have to talk just because you can. You don't have to answer a question just because it's asked. Your confession matters. And Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd like to pray for you. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. If you walked with God, and walked away and thought that you lost your chance to win, I'm talking to you too. All I need you to do is raise your hand. If there is something you need to lay down or pick up today, something you need grace to do, just raise your hand. And if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to do one thing more. I just realized what I would wanted to ask you to do is not going to work. I'm going to ask you to come to the altar so that we, the church, can pray for you together. Beloved, come. I was going to ask you to stand, but then I realized we're all standing, so no one will know who you are. Come. Come so we, the church, can pray for you together. Come for this moment of freedom. Come for this moment of release. Come. Do not miss this opportunity to lay down a burden. Do not miss this opportunity to make your calling and election sure. Do not miss this opportunity to make a decision, to make a confession, and to have all of us come into agreement with you because this moment is a moment of transformation. This moment is a moment of transition. No one left Jesus the same way that they came. If they came broken, they left healed. If they came confused, they left understanding. If they came arrogant, they left convicted. If they came sideways, they left straight. Jesus fixed, Jesus repaired, Jesus redeemed, Jesus restored. And he does the same thing to each and every one of us. There is an opportunity for us to...
The moments in our lives when we meet Jesus boil down for every one of us, not just for human history, to B.C. and A.D. There was our life before Christ, and there was our life once He stepped in, once we came to know Him, once we came to walk with Him in a new way, once we came to surrender all. This is a moment of surrender. This is a moment of transformation. This is a moment of transition. And this is a moment of truth. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. So let us continue to praise God in this moment. There are a few people still coming. Beloved, we can continue to believe God for something new in this moment because the people that we see here are just a, a type and a shadow of the people who are being changed. Every one of them represents a family. Every one of us represents a community. Every one of us represents a school, a workplace. A nation is changed one person at a time, beloved. The world is changed one heart at a time. Institutions are changed one person at a time. So let us praise God. Praise God for this moment and let us praise God some more. Now, we stand here at this altar with a thousand different burdens, but one almighty God. So whatever decision you are making in this moment, Please pray this prayer with me. Father, thank you for this opportunity to receive your love. I repent of my sin. I believe Christ died on the cross to pay the price for my sin and rose again, conquering death. I confess him as Lord and Savior, and your word says I'm born again. Thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you that no matter how many times I fall, I can get back up. If I confess, you will wash me clean. Today, I will walk by faith and not by sight. Today, I will lay down my hurts and pick up hope. Today, I will lay down my doubt and pick up faith. Today, I will lay down my will and pick up your cross and follow you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God praise? For a new season, for a new beginning, for a new opportunity, for a new understanding, for new freedom and new faith. Family, we believe if you prayed those prayers, you are born again, you're beginning the process of restoration, and you are ready to take new steps in the work. But change is not an event, it's a process. Wherever you are in this walk, I need you to do four things. One, begin to study the Word. Two, get in a Bible teaching church. Three, tell someone about the decision you made today. Four, keep showing up. And know this, Jesus did not lose one of his disciples, and he's not going to lose you either. You will need grace. You will need to repent. You will mess up. But when you repent, you can start over. And God will bring you people to restore you. And for that, we should all give him praise. Now, if you responded to this call via our internet service, we have some information we'd like to give you, so please call or text the number on your screen. May God continue to bless you. Your life will never be the same, and now you may be seated. And now let's all stand. <laughs> Were you glad to be here today, beloved? Did you get a word today? Did you experience worship today? Did you experience fellowship today? Did you receive something that you can take with you into the week? Beloved, my prayer for you today is that this was a type and a shadow of the week and the month and the season to come. Because with all of the forecasts and all of the predictions of doom and gloom, 
it was a whole lot of noise and then just a little sprinkle. There are so many situations in our lives where if, we, if our ears are open and if our hearts are broken, the devil will make a whole lot of noise. Try to get us to quit. Try to get us just to not even bother to show up when all that's standing in our way is just a little sprinkle. I ask that you keep praying. Keep praying for your leadership. Keep praying for your family. Keep praying for that one person who works your last nerve, especially them. Tell someone difficult that you love them today. And don't be offended if someone now turns to you. Because it's all love. So let us say something good as we leave this place, but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord, period. We believe it, we proclaim it, and we're seeing it come to pass. God bless everybody. See you soon. Family, thank you so much for watching CCC's YouTube channel. If you feel what you just experienced impacted your life in any way, we encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this video with others so we can fulfill our mission in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. We welcome you to check out some of our other videos. Also, make sure to click the notification bell so you are the first to know when we post a new one. Our praise and worship team brings us a powerful and dynamic live worship experience every Sunday. And trust me and Cameron when I say, you do not want to miss it. Streaming times are in the description box below. And if you are looking for any other information about what's happening here at CCC, visit www.cccinfo.org. We hope to see you next Sunday, but for now, continue to have a blessed week in the Lord.